welcome everybody to um, Montessori Europe webinar, the monthly get together of the many faces on the screen, which we have seen on Saturday. And those of you who have managed to participate on Saturday, this is kind of a quite a natural continuation, focusing more on the work that we can do uh, with the children. And this session was prompted by um, initial introduction of the concept or of the framework of mirrors and windows introduced to us by Tammy Osting, who is very kindly agreed to be one of our facilitators tonight. So welcome, Tammy. Thank you. And um, we decided to do it following Andy um, Lulka's presentation on the environment, where she refers directly to the need for the environment to both reflect the children's own stories and be able to open the sliding doors and look beyond the classroom, what it has to offer. And we have asked Hannah Kiani to share her thoughts on the topic with us tonight, because I know that this is a subject very close to her heart and um, so welcome, Hannah. Would you like to introduce yourself? Um, I think that just before you go on, just reminder to everybody, please stay muted and uh, put questions in the chat if you have any before we go. Any other? Um, no, thank you very much. Over to you, Hannah, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Barbara. Hello, everyone. It's so lovely to see so many smiling faces and names on the screen. As Barbara said, my name's Hannah and I work at a small Montessori school in North London called Unity. And I'm just going to attempt to share my screen. Let's see. OK, has that worked? Good. <laughs> OK. So Barbara has invited me today to talk to you about mirrors and windows which was introduced by Emily Style for the National Seed Project. And Style sees a mirror as a way to reflect your own culture and help build your own identity, an opportunity which can provoke us into looking really carefully and prompt us to consider who we are. A window, on the other hand, can be a way into see to, to see into somebody else's experience. It's like on a dark winter's evening, Walking past people's windows can allow us a glimpse of other people's lives. It can help us to see beyond ourselves. And in early years, we want to enable children to learn about themselves and to use this experience as a way of learning about others too. If we look at this quote, Style says, it is limiting and inaccurate to only educate our children provincially when they must live their lives in a global context, facing vast differences and awesome similarities. They must learn early and often about the valid framing of both windows and mirrors for a balanced ecological sense of their place in the world. I would suggest that if we're to follow the child, this means challenging ourselves to create windows and mirrors in all areas of the classroom. So I hope today to share some examples from practice that have helped me to reflect on this idea of promoting a global context and also ways that children can learn early and often to gain a sense of place in their world. So how do we create windows and mirrors in all areas of the classroom? During COVID, we've been confronted with windows as a safe way to see loved ones, even if we can't touch them. And some of the stories and images have been heart-wrenching. In discussing windows and mirrors in early years, perhaps the metaphor of Dr. Rudine Sims Bishops is helpful. Not a window like a safety barrier, but a window that enables children to see into other cultures. Dr. Sims Bishop writes that a book can be like a sliding door, a sliding glass door, which empathetic teachers can open and guide the children through so that children can walk between different worlds as they share in a wide variety of books, music and food from different cultures and see perhaps for the first time the similarities and differences between themselves and their friends. 
One of the students I was supporting in placement at a Montessori school in London told me of her experiences. She came into the classroom and sat down at the same table as a little girl. The girl looked up from her activity and said, I can't play with you because you are brown and that means you're dirty and horrible. As you can imagine, the student was shocked into silence. As was I when she shared her experience with me. So what can we do? We need some tools. Silence is not going to cut it. In this instance, we need to support the little girl to understand better that the view she holds is wrong. We made resources, we used books, and we helped to explore these ideas with this little girl and her family, and in fact, the whole school. So maybe we can start in the book corner. In the book corner, Dr. Rudin Sims Bishops writes that all children deserve books that act as a mirror. This enables a child to see their lives reflected in the text, plus windows into other cultures beyond their own. We need a great variety of different resources for teachers to share with young children to prompt a richer dialogue between families and between practitioners. Books can act as a bridge between communities and sharing books can be the very first experience for a young child who recognises similarities and differences between themselves and their friends at nursery. So what books work? In the UK, we have a long way to go still to ensure that we reflect the cultures of the children in our settings. In 2018, a survey called Reflecting Realities was conducted by the Centre for Literacy and Primary Education. This survey revealed that over 11,000 new children books were published in the UK in 2018, but only 4% featured a non-white hero. With a third of children from black ethnic minority backgrounds enrolled in UK schools, that means there's still a significant gap between the experiences of children and the stories that they read. This means it's more important than ever that we look at our resources and also that children see a person that looks like them. They need mirrors that reflect themselves and their experiences. A three-year-old in our setting this year was transfixed by a photo book of a family celebrating Chinese New Year. She looked at this book every day for two weeks, asking the practitioners about the photos. Maybe for her, this was the first time she'd seen her own culture reflected so clearly in a book at school. The other message that books can carry then is to give children a sense of their own value and a shared perspective. So we have to look carefully at the books we have. It's not just about children needing to see children that look like them, but also that act like them. Books like It's a No Money Day that shares the story of visiting a food bank or My Name is Not Refugee. Books that celebrate all are welcome here, that reflect disability or difference and books that honour it's okay to be different. Books that looked after children, see their experience of fostering, illustrated and understood. Perhaps books that might prevent microaggression in the future, such as Hair Love, are all important in helping to create an early years environment that values and celebrates diversity. This then is a challenge. I wonder if we can all take a moment to think, how can we as practitioners avoid a tokenistic approach and continue to learn better both about and from the children in our care. As we operate in small segregated groups during COVID, perhaps we need to be more creative than ever. We need to invite families to create photo books and films to email in of their own traditions and cultures to share and use in the setting so that children can find out about more about their place in the world. In our setting, the majority of our grandparents live outside of the UK. This could be our chance to harness some of the richness that living in a multicultural city provides. Rather than shying away from technology in our classrooms, how wonderful if we can Zoom a school or speak to grandparents who live in a different country. 
Style notes it is limiting and inaccurate to only educate our children provincially when they must live their lives in a global context facing vast differences and awesome similarities. So how do we support children to see these vast differences and awesome similarities? You may have already thought of lots of interesting ways to do this and perhaps you can share some of these ideas in your breakout rooms. One thing we did in our setting was to invite our families to add photos to the world map and the children would delight in telling us about aunts and uncles, grannies and grandpas that lived far away. The families we have are varied, they're blended and mixed and they're big and they're small. These photos provided the foundation for children to start to see some of the differences between their own world and that of their friends, as children discussed how many mummies did they have or whose uncle was the biggest and the strongest. During Valentine's celebrations this year, family members were invited to send in messages to the children that we could read out. Receiving positive messages presented children with the understanding that they were all much loved. This seemed to me a great starting place for a shared experience, as the children heard how important they were to their families and friends. It could be argued that we're operating in a place of great privilege where the children had access to messages of love from families and friends. And this too is a reminder to us. We must be sensitive and aware. We must strive to make all our families feel welcome and our children feel loved. For some children, family life might be frightening and chaotic. The early year setting may be the only place where they have routine and love and care. So I think it's important for us to commit to being that place. How amazing it would be that one of the awesome similarities we have is a sense of love and care for each other and for each child that walks through our doors. Having a thoughtful selection of books then may not be enough. Uh, I don't know about you, but we've got lots of children that never visit the book corner if they can help it. They're far too busy climbing and using a hammer in the outside style notes that children must learn early and often. So that has to mean going beyond books. An early years environment that values and celebrates diversity is one where children find out about respect and tolerance. For children to truly learn the importance of tolerance and to challenge stereotypes, they need to be given lots of opportunities to practice these skills. In order for a book about Chinese New Year to become meaningful for all the children, it means exploring many aspects of the celebration over time to avoid a light or tokenistic approach. Then we can feel as if we're providing children with an opportunity to step through a sliding door into a new world of interesting food tastes, fabrics and smells, music that confronts and traditions that demand respect and appreciation. I would say that we need to also think about lessons of kindness, as well as letting children practice uh, being kind to each other. We need to think about how we can embed into every aspect of the day these lessons of kindness. Children can be encouraged to see that listening to someone when they speak is a kind act. In order to really value other people, children need the chance to practice practical ways to do this and perhaps listening can be a starting point. I wonder what practical ways we can all think of to share in our nurseries of ways to listen and listen carefully to the children in our care. Perhaps while I talk you could think of ideas and add them to the chat. What ideas do, do we use that might develop a listening culture that fosters the ambition of the children and that also enables empathy and respect to grow. One book in our setting that we've used is called Colour Monster. Children have painted their feelings, moved to their feelings and shared their feelings. And I think this has to be the start of appreciating similarities and differences. It enables us to listen in lots of different ways and activities that enable children to see how we're similar we all have bones and organs and hearts and we all feel sad and cross and calm. These activities must be part of our day to day to help children through the sliding door 
to a better understanding of their awesome similarities. As a new child joined our setting this term, without speaking any English at all, I was struck again by the way that Montessori materials speak without words. How amazing that we have these materials that can be shared without a common language at all. How careful we must be then not to become complacent as well, but continue to provide experiences that reflect and value the diversity of children's families. We need to work even harder to provide resources and activities in early years settings that challenge gender, cultural and racial stereotyping and reduce prejudice. As we saw in the quote from Style, we need to do this early and often. When a child enters a Montessori classroom for the first time, they can be introduced to materials that they recognise and lots that they don't. A pestle and mortar with herbs and spices to grind and squash can evoke memories and smells that might remind a child of home. And knob cylinders can be chosen and used without the need for language at all. Our materials mean that the environment is really important. It can be a place where a child feels they belong. In recognising familiar objects, children can see themselves and their families reflected and valued. This then becomes a mirror. How amazing that we, as early years teachers, can support celebrate children's celebration of difference and similarity. And we mustn't be complacent about the mirrors we provide, but must keep finding out ways to enhance our provision, to give children an understanding of the richness of the world in which they live. Children can understand big topics, science and history, climate change, and we saw at the weekend, sustainability. Let's make sure our classrooms become like sliding doors for all who enter. Having celebration bags in the setting can be a good way for children to talk about their own traditions. Families can be involved in putting together photo books for the nursery that explain their own celebrations. We must also know that as practitioners, we need to keep learning. In our setting, one family really surprised us by refusing to send their child to school for the last day of term because we were giving out Christmas decorations made by the children and we were singing jingle bells and a song about snowmen. We'd thought long and hard about ways to present our Christmas celebration. We shied away from a nativity and went instead with a selection of songs chosen by the children that represented the season. We also invited parents to donate to the local food bank and we talked a lot about giving and how we can give to others. Our secular Christmas celebration though was seen as too Christian for this particular family. It was a stark reminder for us all to revisit our policies and the way that we communicate. Were we clear at the outset that we celebrate the festivals of all the children in the nursery? And how can we avoid situations in the future where families refuse to walk through the sliding door with us? Part of the answer has to be that we keep reflecting, we keep communicating and we keep learning. The challenge for us then as practitioners is building a culturally sensitive curriculum that confronts complacency and putting up mirrors means providing ongoing context for the children, a holistic approach that isn't just, you know, an add on. It's exciting to think that we have such scope in our classrooms to provide these opportunities because we have space in every area of the curriculum to provide all of this. Uh, we can provide lots of resources for children to connect through a mirror and experience a sliding door. But what else must we do? If we're to provide a global context for the children in our care, we need to reflect upon our provision. I mean, I like to think that our shelves and book corner are well stocked with a range of materials that reflect our local community. And yet, for the first time this term, I've celebrated all kinds of new festivals. Worried about COVID, for example, in January, we called a family to ask where the whereabouts of a little girl. With much apology, the parents explained their daughter would be late to school because they were celebrating Tai Pong Gal. This is a festival I've never celebrated before, 
And I'm ashamed to say I hadn't, hadn't realised it was a four day event. I wondered how this little girl might feel that important moments in her life weren't represented at school, especially when they'd recently entered into the spirit of Christmas by giving to the teachers with such enthusiasm. We asked the parents for some help and the next day the parents provided us with some sugar cane in its natural form and pictures and celebratory food. As teachers, we learnt more about the festival and the little girl and her family. Together, we were able to share in this special festival. This window allowed children and teachers alike to learn from other people's experience. This then is the challenge. How can we avoid a tokenistic approach and ensure an inclusive response to all the children in our care? My response has to be that as well as a commitment to keep learning, the second thing is we need to ask for help. We encourage the children in the setting to say, help please, when something is too busy or a zip traps a child in a coat. This is the point too. As adults, we must commit to continuous learning and accept limitations and ask for help. It's impossible to find out about the experience of others if we do not ask for help in finding out. And I think this ability to learn and develop empathy and understanding is, is part of what defines the human experience. As Montessori teachers, what a delight when we can wonder afresh at this human experience. We are so privileged as teachers that we can share in practices and celebrations from around the world. How exciting that we can role model a great love of learning and can grow and develop friendships and respect for our fellow humans in a global context. Style talks about this global context and it's true in our corner of London. Children arrive in the classroom speaking many languages, but none of them English. We need to ask for help as practitioners if we're going to support these children to, to be able to have what Style calls a sense of their place in the world. So as practitioners, we must keep learning and we must ask for help to grow our own understanding. I think th thinking about windows and mirrors is a time to reflect on our own practice. Research highlights the 30 million word gap and it shows that a family's socioeconomic status and parental education heavily shape children's learning too. Research shows us that early language development, early language development skills are important for children's longer term success. So what we do in early years really matters. Montessori says, we shall walk together in this path of life, for all things are part of the universe and we are connected with each other to form one whole unity. It is vital that we walk together with our children and our families and that we work in cooperation to develop listening and language skills, empathy and kindness. It can be hugely challenging too. Montessori says we must be humble and root out the prejudice lurking in our hearts. We all exist within our own context of tradition and understanding and shaking off firmly held ideas is difficult and can be overwhelming. Perhaps we have the challenge that our school community is monolingual or made up of families from a similar background. Perhaps we need to work hard to bring a global context to our classroom. Overall, the goal is for us to learn from the child and the family to listen and to connect, and then to use that knowledge to create a more authentic learning environment for the child and the class as a whole. It is limiting and inaccurate to only educate our children provincially when they must live their lives in a global context. In our global context, we are confronted with global concerns. In the past year, we've been struck by a dreadful series of events a global pandemic, the death of George Floyd, coups, job losses, riots and fires, earthquakes and wars, and increasing numbers of refugees. To promote empathy and tolerance and courage, we can remember that Montessori urges us to remember that education is the best weapon for peace. This is a sliding door we can help our children through. We can help them to grow up to be custodians of their world. We cannot hide away from global concerns. 
we must equip the children in our care to be resilient and creative and walk proudly through doors to find solutions and work with others. As Montessori says, the child who has felt a strong love for his surroundings and for all living creatures who has discovered joy and enthusiasm in work gives us a reason to hope that humanity can develop in a new direction. This then is what we need to do. We need to work to foster that experience. We need to allow children to, uh, to find out more about themselves and each other. And so I'm really grateful. Thank you so much for letting me talk on about my experience from practice. Thank you so much, Hannah. Um, and thank you above all for sharing the vulnerability of the adult when working and challenging these difficult topics. Uh, the, we can try it as much as we need to, or we should try from the bottom of our heart, but it's almost inevitable that we will not always get it right. What is important is that we continue to learn, as you have said. And so we turn to you, dear friends who join us, to think of ideas that could help you to introduce new opportunities to use mirrors, open the sliding doors, and look out of the window towards the global community. What will you bring to your classrooms tomorrow, having heard the webinar tonight? I hope you had wonderful conversations. And may I um, invite Tammy to share some of the thoughts from her session? I'd be delighted to. Thank you, Barbara. Um, we had a really rich conversation that really focused on, um, I think, us as practitioners to begin with and to look at how is it that we can uh, create authenticity in reflecting uh, stories and situations that aren't just our own and that we have to work on some of our own biases. The Erasmus project for teachers as a transnational meeting to share and visit different settings uh, was brought up as a way to prepare self, including our biases and also to have a window out into the world. Um, some very practical ideas that came together were the sliding door understanding of connecting a very generalized um, something that we all have in common like soup and how individualized and um, differentiated soup can be in every culture from how we eat it to the containers it's in to how it's made and a practical idea came in about having cookbooks from all over the world in your cooking area and how um, delightful that can be. Um, also, the, there was a conversation about how including parents in from the very beginning, so that there was, again, authentic representation in the room, um, bringing in foods and dialogue and inviting families into the classroom 
And there was even a description of being able to visit a family who invited the community into their home um, was really, really beautiful. Um, and then I, there was also um, at the very end, we were starting to talk about how elders transmit culture and uh, the idea of how in indigenous culture that language and civilization and the movement forward is an essential part of us seeing the whole of um of that sliding door i hope that Lovely. was helpful and i hope i captured it um, authentically <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much um carola would you be able to share yeah thank you barbara um we had a, a group with people from a little bit of everywhere and different ages which was nice and um what struck us most, I think, in the group was the girl celebration that Hannah was talking about um, and how they were not prepared for that. So maybe it sort of raised the little flag for us all that we should be more proactive as practitioners. And perhaps even when people are registering to a school, like they could, they could inform us about what celebrations they have so that we are ready for them when they happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then to create more inclusion in, in that way through opening that window. Also, um, how this pandemic has changed us to use Zoom a lot more and how we perhaps now could, for instance, um, involve the old people's home to seeing them through Zoom and um, which brought in the world map that we was talking about and how we could put all the pictures on the map and draw, um, you know, with a string in between the photos showing the distance between places and start sending postcards to each other and receiving pictures from different countries and yet again, getting maybe our older generation involved who are used to this and, and um, who doesn't like getting a postcard. And, um, um, we also, uh, someone mentioned also the current current affairs and how important it is for maybe um, children then to experience that. And um, um, we would have to use that age appropriately, but yet again, to open the windows for children to know what happens globally in the rest of the world. Um, also folk stories, a wonderful examples from Nigeria of how they sing their stories with clapping and movement and how a family can bring that into the school and let everyone enjoy it by learning from someone else's culture. Um, we talked a lot more, but I think that really sums it up. We should be more proactive as practitioners. It's lovely, thank you, Heidi. Yeah, Barbara, I remember you saying a couple of weeks ago that when you're not the first or the second speaker, then everyone takes all the good stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> I feel like <laughs> thanks a lot to Tammy and Carola for stealing all my ideas. No, I'm kidding. But a lot of what you've said, we did, we did touch on. I, I would just like to pick up on the idea of the conversations and the stories and the importance of you know the, the the elders bringing down the stories and and telling the stories um that that we want to prolong or to to keep that that heritage that the children have um and also perhaps to start maybe this journey by really re reflecting on the mirror um and making sure that every child in the class feels through that mirror their sense of belonging and their sense of value in the class um, and then offering them the window and the sliding door, because when they feel content within themselves, perhaps that, you know, they're then ready to take the next step um, and look at somebody else's as culture. So I think that is a summary of our chat. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Marion? I, I have to say, I agree with Heidi. I think I, I've only got a few bits left. <laughs> Um, we, we talked about traditions, you know, and how that can um, help and support um, 
our understanding uh, of other people and the other things that are going on in their lives. We also talked about on entry to the setting to be informed, to have a wider uh, section of questions that really ensures we get to know people and their you know their festivals their fashion their food what you know what they wear and all of all of these kind of things but we we came up with a couple of very practical suggestions um i think susanna mentioned you know, years ago sending the teddy home you know and what a lovely idea to send teddy home to come back with some experiences of what teddy had experienced in in all of the different households he went to, including Camille made us remember that we must send it to the teachers as well, so that we could share the differences, not just from us, but from the children as well. So we all, all love that. We've forgotten about sending Teddy home and bringing back a story. But also Vanina mentioned, she works with six to nine year olds. And she was saying how, she mentioned windows, mirrors and bridges which I, I thought was, was quite a, a nice way of looking at this as well. And she talked about uh, virtues, the children, it's um, helping the children to s consider the virtues. So sort of like tact and kindness and to explain that more to them so that they can uh, learn to value these different things. Um, I think we also mentioned, um, uh, I like the way um, Tammy mentioned the windows to the world. I think that's what we were trying to talk about. Lynette mentioned um, trying to help children to see that how children play all around the world, depending on the circumstances are, are different, but there are also similarities. And I think that windows to the world is, quite a nice thing to capture to think maybe we can explore that more so yeah that's yeah. thank you Marin Wendy right um well we actually only had two people that could communicate one was Hannah <laughs> <laughs> a lovely lass from Cyprus so we we did we looked at the materials and, and thought about those um and in fact lost the name of the girl from Cyprus, Carola will have to help me. Um, but she was lovely and she was talking about how they show children pictures from uh, of children from different places, like we used to have the continents, and how children see the similarities and get so excited. That child, that's persons like me. And um, we, we talked about that the material should should show similarities and differences and um, something quite interesting we were saying we should really update things or keep an eye on things so we do update them as necessary and we came up with an idea perhaps it would be a good idea to have a staff get together maybe around a meal or something when you go through the materials and looking at them to seeing if they are appropriate um, for the time um, should be careful that we don't stereotype. And um, the interesting one was the music. Nobody's mentioned music. And um, I think that is a, a wonderful way of um, children being exposed to so many different cultures. And again, Corolla School has a multicultural music teacher who apparently is amazing. And the children do these songs from all around the world. Um, and I think that is a brilliant way of incorporating the windows and the mirrors with the children. I also facilitated a room and as Heidi said, um, all the ideas have been shared. However, um, there was, we, we engaged quite a lot in the use of technology and how we have come to reappraise technology as a tool for opening the windows and um, having opportunities to give glimpses of a life today. You know, I think that one of the challenges of our resources in the classroom is that unless we do the audit um, of our resources, as Tammy has mentioned, um, there is a likelihood that we 
become stereotypical in the representation. So we need to revisit, but the, the current, you know, Google Maps, I often think having Google Maps and actually seeing real islands and um, real um, archipelagos and real straits um, suddenly gives you a picture of the kind of diversity of shapes between the land and water, rather than having these little sausages in brown represented on a piece of card, um, or something that looks a little bit like a dog poo, but you try not to mention it. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> sorry to go in the conversation of the nursery. Um, but we have had um, that that conversation about technology has been very, very meaningful. And Alexandra has shared with us in the chat a resource that her nursery has joined um, um, this University of Girona, where they are looking at children's creativity using technology. So maybe Wendelin will be kind enough to share that resource with everybody. Um, in our feedback to our conversation. Um, yeah. So that was our thought. I wonder, Hannah, if you had any closing thoughts for us? No, it's just so lovely to hear all of your ideas. I, I've revealed maybe too much information about how useless we've been at tackling the idea of mirrors and windows and how many mistakes we seem to make on a on a daily basis but um, it's been really lovely and I really enjoyed that idea of soup and thinking about music and different traditions that we can incorporate and um, communicating with the parents and the families and I think for me you know despite making mistakes on a daily basis I love working with the children and finding out more from the families and I think if we all go forward with an open mind and keep reflecting, then that's got to be, you know, a positive step, I would say. So thank you. Thank you, Hannah, very much indeed. Um, our next session will be this Andy Lulka, who will share transformative observations with us on what I believe is the 9th of April or no, not 9th of April, 16th. 16th, 13th. 13th of April. That promises to be a fantastic webinar. We will be challenged once again and we will never see observation in the same way again. So please join us then. Look out for our newsletters from Montessori um, Europe because we are very shortly going to announce our Congress program for May. Those of you who are paid up members of Montessori Europe and would like to have a, a certificate of attendance, please complete this poll that Wendelin is going to put up so that we can um, ascertain your authentic attendance. Um, this is the requirement of our board. So please do that. But above all, please make sure that you take ideas to your classrooms tomorrow or for those who are in the UK on Monday when the children return to schools. And of course, the ideas are not only for the children, they are also perhaps ideas to work with families and above all, to work and reflect on your own biases, because as I said, we all have them and they catch us unawares as Hannah has demonstrated. So there's still work to be done. Please continue to share and participate. It has been a pleasure to have you with us again tonight. Thank you. Mm -hmm.